go ahead, go ahead. Give some glory to the Lord. Give some honor to the Lord. Give some praise to the Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Bishop. And you may be seated for just a moment. I'd like to say thanks to God for, first of all, for the incredible moving of the Holy Ghost that all of us have been able to enjoy here this week and to the sponsors of the Heritage Youth Conference. I say thank you. 18 years at First Pentecostal Church in Colorado Springs. And if I do the math correctly, tonight is the 90th and final church service at this location. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm just of the opinion that we ought to give it our best. Anybody feeling like me tonight? Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Thank you. Be seated to Brother Garrett, Brother Jones, and Brother Lawhorn. Every shot hit the bullseye. Amen. And you can improve on that. And to Sister Jones, pardon my bias, Pentecost's best choir director. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Early this morning, a confirmation from God came to me in my hotel room. That tonight, there would be a Macedonian call from God. A supernatural call from the Almighty God would give absolute direction to young people in this service. And I deeply desire, amen, for there to be the full liberty of the Holy Ghost in this place. Because tonight in this service, God is going to call some young men to preach the gospel. God is going to call some to start a church in a certain city. God is going to call some to go as a missionary to a certain country tonight in this service. Now your pastor is God's man to prepare you and counsel you. That's not my duty or responsibility here at all tonight. I just want to facilitate the call. That's all I desire to do to be obedient to God. Amen. If the sound man would push the mute, mute button there just for a moment, I certainly wouldn't want to burn any bridges for any chance of ever helping any of my family who would ever want to come to truth. But in January of this year, I attended my oldest brother's funeral. And I didn't have a chance to speak at his funeral. Nobody that still walks in truth 
had a chance to speak at his funeral. But at your age, young people, God called him to preach. And God mightily anointed him to preach the gospel at your age. He ran from his call. For a short season, he allowed God to use him and in no sense of false humility. If you had have known Buddy White, Phil White would not be the name that you would remember. Amen. And I sat there at his funeral and the scripture rolled over and over in my mind that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. You don't have to obey God. You really don't. God will never violate your will. He'll never force anybody to do anything for his kingdom. And a whole lot of apostolic young people believe that, oh well, if I get out of the perfect will of God, then at least I can be in the permissive will of God. And I don't want to argue all that with you here today. I just want to settle it in your mind if you've never heard it before. If God calls you, I watched my brother live an unbelievable, tormented life. Gifts and talents beyond anything that any of our relatives have ever possessed. But I watched him live an unbelievably tormented life. So tormented he wouldn't even show up to his own mother's funeral. I watched. And if God calls you and you refuse, you will eventually be turned over to a reprobate mind. It's not a matter of you just finding second best. You just finding somewhere to fit in into the kingdom of God. The gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. And I want to try to help you to know that when God tugs on your heart, it's the most sacred moment that you can ever hope for in your life for you to be ready to say God whatever you want of me 100% of me is ready to do it ready to be obedient unto you and give it my very best I'm reading to you if you will stand please with me from Isaiah chapter number 61. Isaiah chapter 61. Beautiful messianic promise. Verse number one. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes. Will you say that with me? Beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning, garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. 
that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that He, everybody say He, He. might be glorified. And they shall build the old waste. They shall raise up the former desolations. They shall repair the waste cities and the desolations of many generations. Oh, hallelujah. Do you feel that sacred presence of God that I feel? I'm going to preach to you about beauty for ashes. Lift your hands up and ask God. Confirm your word here tonight, God. Confirm your word. Confirm your word, God. Confirm your word here. Oh, God. Confirm your word, Lord. Confirm it, God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, let's cry out together to him. Speak to me, Lord. 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 Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, and you may be seated. Hallelujah. Ashes is mentioned many, many different times in various verses in our Bible a part of the cycle of life that God wants us to all understand, says it is ashes to ashes, dust to dust. To help all of us to understand that when this life is over, no matter how many of our individual goals that we have pursued, no matter how great our accomplishments have been in life, It is still ashes to ashes. It's going to get there one way sooner, amen, one way or another, sooner or later. There are times of mourning that are talked about in the Bible where they were sitting, the Bible said, in sackcloth and in ashes. The most costly of animal sacrifices that I can read about in the Bible, amen, Most of the lambs or the goats or the rams or the turtle doves, the giver, the giver was given back a portion of the sacrifice that they gave to God. And they and the priest were allowed to eat together and enjoy a portion of many, many hundreds of sacrifices that are described in the Bible. God said, I want, I want you to be getting something out of this as well as God getting something out of that. And so it was uh, that the blood was the only thing that was given completely over to God. The Passover lamb that many of the Jewish people still celebrate in one form or another today, it was actually a buffet meal for the entire family that was there. All that God was wanting was the blood out of that and everybody else could live high on the hog. It was Thanksgiving or it was Christmas Day and they could all have themselves a a wonderful, wonderful meal that was there. But there was a special, a special sacrifice that God talks about over and over in the Bible, and that was the sacrifice of a whole burnt offering. That was a sacrifice that God said, amen, this one is different than all of the above. This isn't a little bit for you and a little bit for God and a little bit for your kids that are here. Whole burnt 
offerings uh, were required uh, that they would get a bullock. And it is strange to me if you want to look at it a little carefully in your Bible that on 26 different occasions in the Bible, God said it is to be a young bullock. A young bullock. He said there's something extra special about that kind of sacrifice uh, in the whole burnt offering uh, before the Lord. That that bullock had its whole life ahead of it. It had all of the opportunities uh, that would be there for all it could do and become. Uh, but I am asking you to bring it. Uh, he said, I mean from the hoofs, uh, the horns, the hide, uh, from every piece of meat uh, that is upon it, every bone that is there. I want that entire sacrifice reduced all the way down to ashes. Ashes. There's nothing left over. Develop your own crematorium, if you please. And make sure, no matter what size that it started out as, no matter how big that it was of a creature, of an animal that's there, amen, when you are finished with it, I want you to present unto God the ashes that were there of that bullock. In particular, Exodus, the 29th chapter, gives us the occasion where he's talking about hallowing and ordaining young, men and sons for ministry for sacred things that they are going to do for God for the rest of their lives that are there. He said to hallow them that minister to the Lord in the priest amen office. He said that's one of the places make sure it is a young bullock don't wait uh, until you've squeezed some of the life out of it. Uh, don't wait until you've made it useful uh, for your own purposes uh, for the first few years of its life uh, and say it's starting to lose a little strength and energy and vim and vigor and vitality uh, and all of a sudden that's when I'm going to decide uh, that I'm ready now to give it to God. Oh, I wish I could preach something to, to just simply inspire you here tonight. Uh, but God won't let me, young people. Uh, I'm back again to try to challenge you uh, in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. That you are the young bullocks uh, that are sitting uh, in the house of God, in the kingdom of God tonight. Uh, and there is an almighty God It's saying, I don't want you wanting any part of it for yourself. I want all of it. I want all of it. Don't worry, I'm not going to strip you of every good thing in life. Because my plan is, it's beauty for ashes. The day that you not only think about it, but you hand over those ashes to me is your God. I will, in exchange, give you something far more beautiful than you could ever dream of in all of your life. 
I will give you the greatest purpose that you could have ever, amen, imagined could happen to you. I will bless you in ways beyond, amen. There's seemingly nothing in it for the giver when it comes to the big sacrifices of life. But there is a God that said, I will be debtor to no man. <laughs> Hallelujah. There is absolutely nothing you will ever give God uh, that he won't give you back something better. Oh, hallelujah. There's nothing big enough uh, that you can give to God uh, that he won't give you something bigger. Amen. Amen. He said he'll give it in exchange. Now I got a $5 bill here today and I want to give this in exchange for the first young person that can make it up here with five coins. I don't care if it's pennies, nickels, dimes, quarters. I want to make an exchange with you here. Boy, thank God this generation don't carry any cash nowadays. I may get to go home with my $5. Oh, there he is. Okay. Who won? You guys be the judge. He got it. Okay. Okay. Now, amen. This isn't counterfeit. This is real. But I'm not giving this to you if you're going to keep your coins. It's this in exchange for that. Is that a deal? Too many young people want to hang on to their ashes. Mourn over it. Long pity parties all of their life. Their big regrets of all the sacrifices they had to do for God. And God said, you ain't getting beauty <laughs> until you hand me your ashes. Is it a deal, buddy? One, two, three, four. This guy's sharp. It's four pennies and one nickel. Good job, buddy. Good job. God said, I'll make the trade with you. I'll make the trade with you. You can't have a victim mentality. And expect me to give you a beautiful life. You can't hang on to that poor me attitude. And expect me to give you unspeakable joy. God said I know about everything that happened in your childhood. I know about everything that's ever taken place in your life. And I have got an unbelievable exchange to offer you. But only, 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 only when you put the ashes in my pocket and no longer in yours will you get what I've got to offer modern Jewish festivals of celebration. The number one celebration is still to this day, the day of atonement. And my, did that choir ever sing about the blood tonight. It was the day of the blood being sprinkled on the mercy seat. Their sins were covered. Wow, that's a day to celebrate, buddy. 
That is an unbelievable day that, amen, it's easy to smile, it's easy to shout, it's easy to sing, it's easy to dance, it's easy to have a party when you think about, amen, that celebration of what God did for us. Uh, but the second, the second, right behind uh, that festival of celebration uh, comes the fifth day of Av, which involves ashes, 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 dealing, uh, amen, with ashes, your ashes, my ashes, the ashes that life has produced uh, inside of us in the journey. For you see, the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD was made of native limestone. And if you know anything about limestone, it's different from all of the other stones uh, that you know about in uh, that it can be lit on fire and it can burn all the way down to the ground and so it was uh, the strategy of the Roman general Titus uh, to do just exactly that to the Jewish nation uh, and take their beautiful temple uh, and set their torches in many different locations uh, and get it so hot, the fire going uh, until it was burnt all the way down to ashes. Uh, Josephus, the Jewish historian who lived in Bible days, uh, a man told of when the temple was reduced to ashes ashes uh, that the Jewish leaders among them uh, amen told them uh, this is a sad terrible tragedy of our lives uh, and for the next seven days uh, we will mourn we will weep uh, amen we will sit here in the ashes in the devastation uh, of what's happening to our nation to our people to our temple that we love so much uh, over and over in the Bible God commanded days of mourning I don't want you to think there's an imbalance uh, in what I'm trying to preach to you here tonight. Uh, God knew uh, that we as human beings, uh, amen, needed to cry when we lost a loved one. He knew we needed uh, to deal with our mourning uh, in other ways than just biting our lip uh, and acting like nothing really happened, uh, that it was necessary. He knows that we are human beings beings, uh, but that same God also knew, uh, amen, how destructive that morning would become if it went on too long if it carried on too long amen how it would begin to destroy our future of what God had planned for us if all we did was look in the rear view mirror at the things that were devastating in our lives that were there amen let me say it again God knows uh, if you had divorced parents. Uh, God knows some of you were born. Uh, I know of those in my church uh, when your mom and dad were homeless uh, and born out on the street. Uh, God knows all about every bit of child abuse uh, that you ever went in. Uh, God knows uh, when that romance that you thought was going to end up as a marriage uh, end up being a failed romance. Uh, and things broke up. God knows all about that. He knows your broken dreams of your life that have happened unto you. But God also knows, amen, that the second most important festival of celebration in your life, after you get done shouting about the blood and grateful for the wonderful atonement, he said, I got another celebration celebration uh, that I need you to participate. Uh, he said you're only allowed uh, a space of time for your morning uh, and then it is time. Uh, amen. When your highest hopes uh, have turned to ashes. Uh, it
it's time for you to bust out of your mourning and said, I'm ready to celebrate again a God that took me through the valley, a God that brought me through the trial, a God, amen, that didn't let it destroy me. So the Jewish custom was that the young single daughters of Jerusalem, seven days after their world came crashing down, seven days, all of the young single daughters of Jerusalem borrowed a wedding dress from somebody that had already been married. Oh, hallelujah. You ain't got much joy if you can't celebrate somebody else's wedding. All you want to do is pine about why yours hadn't come yet. Borrowed wedding dresses. Oh, hallelujah. And every one of the single young girls in Jerusalem went out to the vineyards. Hallelujah. And got in the vineyards and went and danced together in the vineyards and said, Amen. The ashes are all that's left. But we ain't looking back anymore. We're looking forward. Time to break out the tambourine. Uh, Time to get out in the vineyard. Uh, Time to start celebrating. Uh, Amen. Uh, There's a change uh, coming. Uh, There's a change uh, coming. Uh, I know it's been bad. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. God bless you. Please be seated. But they started looking forward to the next generation. They started. Amen. I'm here to tell you the Lord has a vineyard. And dancing with joy as we labor in his vineyard makes you focus on the blessings of the Lord. The blessings of the Lord. What he has done in your life. It's all about the Lord's harvest. It's all about the Lord's harvest. That is where you'll find beauty for ashes. If you don't want the vineyard, you don't want to work in the vineyard, don't worry. Your ashes will never be turned to beauty. Amen. God planned it that way. He will exchange it. You'll find your place there working in the harvest field. It might be in a home missions church, starting a brand new church. Cities that are crying, the lost of the cities are crying. For somebody to go, for somebody. Maybe on a foreign field. You study the life of Elisha real closely, you'll see he found his anointing across Jordan in a foreign country. It was the land of the Ammonites where Elisha was first used in the gifts. It was a young man that was willing to follow God's call. Even when God took him out of his comfort zone. Even when God took him to that place. I'm here to tell you tonight, I know there are some, and I'm not fighting against anybody here tonight. But there are some that have espoused the idea when it comes to missions that it's all about just finding and facilitating. 
that it's all about finding these native pastors somewhere and just sending offerings over to them. And that's how we as apostolics have done our duty of taking the gospel to the world. But that's hard to find in the New Testament church. Matter of fact, if you can find one scriptural example of that, please come tell me after service. Amen. On the day of Pentecost, Acts 2 and 5, said they were gathered out of every nation under heaven, 16 different language groups that were there. And the great commission that was given unto them was not to send offerings to Jerusalem, to send offerings to Judea, to send offerings to Samaria, to send offerings to the uttermost parts of the world. The commission was, you go, you go, you go, you go. You go take this gospel that you just came out of the upper room and enjoyed the outpouring of the Spirit. You go. The promise he made was unto you and your children and your children's children. And the only way that next generation in that foreign country is going to hear it is you, if you can get some of your children to go. If you can get some of your children's children to go. If you can get somebody to carry the gospel not on their credit card but on their shoulders. If you can get somebody that will carry it to the places that are lost. Jonah would have gladly sent an offering to Nineveh. But God called him to go. God called him to go. I hope you won't judge me too harshly with what I'm fixing to say because I promise you I don't believe there's any pride connected to it. But I sat and wept and rejoiced in God as I looked and realized and totaled up all that our church had given to missions in the last 10 years and rejoiced over the dreams that God had given me of how many churches he wanted to have me to build on foreign soil and how close to that goal I already was in life. And I rejoiced over the fact that in the last 10 years, our church We're not home missions, but we're a far cry from the largest church you've ever been in. Had given over $1 million to missions the past 10 years. And I I was praying in thanksgiving and telling God how grateful I was. And saying, God, please, please, it... That might not be a sacrifice to you, but it sure feels like it's a sacrifice to us. But God spoke to me that day and said, Pastor, you're not an Antioch New Testament church because you give big sacrificial offerings to missions. You become an Antioch church when you start producing young missionaries you become an Antioch church when the best and the brightest 
that sit on your pew are feeling the passion burning in their hearts that said, Pastor, I got to go. I got to go take the gospel. Tell me what I need to do. Train me and get me ready for taking the gospel to do all that I can possibly do. Amen. I got involved in a missions work. I'm not a missionary. I told him I wasn't, but until God could get a yes from somebody that he's called to the Philippines, I'd fill in and pinch hit and do all that I could do to help the work that was over there. And I meant it, and I've tried to do it to the very best of my ability. Pastor had, or the missionary had retired after 39 years. Health problems had forced him out. And I remember that very first time I walked down the ramp there in Manila. It was four o'clock in the morning and a large group of them were gathered together outside looking at who was coming to help them. And it was my wife and I walking after you've been on a plane for 16 hours. You ain't walking too good. You're not looking too good, at least not at my age. And my wife really, really had a hard time when I told her this story. The group of natives that were there told me later. They said, when we first saw you and your wife come down, the ramp we said God bless them for coming but they're an old couple are there any this was their words are there any young preachers left in America that are willing to go be a missionary in another country I didn't have an honest answer to give them. Maybe you can help me answer that question tonight. Maybe you can help me. Apostle Paul found a Silas and a Titus and a Timothy and a Marcus and a Lucas. Onesimus, a total of 16 young bullocks responded and said, Paul, it won't die out at Nero's chopping block when your head gets cut off. We will carry the torch when you can't carry it any longer. We will take all of our dreams, all of our plans, all of the bright futures that we've dreamed that our young lives were going to produce. And we'll reduce them all the way down to ashes. And we'll stick our hands out to the Almighty God. And say, there it is, Lord. Everything I ever dreamed about becoming is burned in ashes. Do with me what you want to do. Brother Riggins, who will go to the African countries? Where by the hundreds they're getting the revelation. Of the oneness of God. Tell me are there any young men. Please tell me brother Riggins. Are there any young men that's talking to you brother. Any young men saying I'll go brother Riggins. 
I'll go. I'll go. It's in God's vineyard is where he exchanges beauty for ashes. I want to ask the Shrek eyes kids that are here in our midst tonight to come if they will. Whichever of them are able to come. Amen. And I want them to stand not on the top step, but just this very next step, if they'll just kind of get centered there to where all of you young people can see them. I've been to Honduras. I've watched these these beautiful apostolic young people. I've been in their home. I've been in church with them. I've been there and watched, brother, there ain't no pity parties going on that I've ever seen out of the Shrekizes. They are so happy to be working for God and laboring for God. But I've asked the sound man, if he would, to put up for you on the overhead so you're able to see. A verse out of that choir medley that you sang just last night. You sang a beautiful, beautiful medley of songs about how you were committed to make sure that his truth endured to all generations. And you sang I heard your voices. I felt your passion as you sang about a vow to carry on and take the gospel to every nation. What did you mean by that? Does your vow mean that only those that were raised in missionary homes on foreign fields? Honduras is a big country. If every one of them follow in their mom and dad's footsteps, uh, they still won't be enough to cover that one country by itself. What did you mean by that vow? If no Americans born in the lap of luxury having everything you want handed to you were ever going to be willing to say, I'll go. My vow! My vow! Bishop, when you're dead and gone, we vowed that we'd take the gospel to every nation. Not just missionaries, kids, please. When is the last time you heard an apostolic young person talk to you as another young person and said, I feel like God may want me to be a missionary. I feel like God may be wanting me to do it. As Sister Jones comes to the piano, before anybody stands, I would like to invite the pastors, especially the pastors, who have young people that are here tonight. I would like to invite you to come and spread out and fill this platform area with me here tonight. Because I would like nothing better than for your hand to be laid upon the head of a young person from your church 
as they finally <laughs> take their ashes, lay them at the feet of Jesus. Say, God, I will. Sister Jones has a song to sing, and I don't want anybody to come to the altar yet. I just want you to hear the song for a couple of minutes and be ready to come when I tell you to come. Sing for us, Sister the Jones. The harvest is ripe. The fields are empty. Jesus said, who will go? The harvest is ripe. The fields are empty. Jesus said, who will go? Oh, <laughs> 